people in America affiliate with some kind of Christian religion. But that's not really the definition of a Christian, is it? You see, to me, a real Christian is someone who has had a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. Someone who has recognized that they are a sinner and they have sought God's forgiveness of, his, of their sin by accepting Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, as their Savior. The one who went to Calvary's hill and shed his precious blood on that cross and died for their sin. They know that, they believe that, and they accept that he has granted them eternal life and they commit their life to living for him through, the, through his teachings. Now to me, see, that's a Christian. Just because you go to a Christian church that makes you a Christian any more than walking into a garage makes you a car. <laughs> And by that definition, and I don't have statistics to prove it, because we don't know how many true Christians there are in America, but by that definition, I would say the majority of Americans are not true Christians. Anybody agree with that? And thus, I can't believe that we're a Christian nation. Even if we go back in history, from the time of our founding as a nation in 1776, do you know most Americans, even then, were not real Christians? Now, maybe again, maybe the majority of the people at that time affiliated with some Christian religion, just like today, but I doubt that the majority of the people, even in those days, had a real born-again experience with Jesus Christ. In fact, we know from history that many had traveled to the New World in hopes of making a lot of money. They were motivated by materialism. And I know that some were exiled here as criminals. And some came to escape religious persecution. But by the time we declared ourselves an independent and free nation in 1776, there were all kinds of people living in America. So even though we were not then really a Christian nation and certainly are not really a Christian nation today. There was something that our forefathers in those early years of American history, there was something that they had then that we've almost totally lost today. And this is the key. I believe that most Americans in the early years had a real true belief in the authority of God's Word. Now you say that sounds fairly simple. Well, a simple solution. Well, think about this. If you think of the men who signed the founding documents of our nation, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the United States Constitution. The total number of men would come to 204. And I would suggest to you that because of their instrumental roles in the establishment of our country, we might consider these 204 men as our founding fathers. History tells us that all 204 of them were affiliated with Christian religions. Now, whether or not they were true believers or not, I don't know. That's something that only God knows. But I would say this, that from the wording of the documents that they wrote, that our country was built upon, it is easy to see that all of these men had a belief in the authority of the Bible. Now, whether again, whether they accepted it as the Word of God or whether they really uh, tried to live by its principles or not, I don't know the answer to that. But if, for instance, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, it uses words like this. It says, we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. Strictly a biblical phrase. If you look at the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, it is written to protect the religious liberties that we have from government intrusion. And so, I would submit to you that all of these founding fathers, in fact, probably most all Americans of that time, believed in the basic, uh, fundamental, 
Judeo-Christian principles and ethics that are presented in the Bible. They accepted the biblical standard as the surest foundation upon which to build a great society. And consequently, the laws that they established, I believe, reflect the laws of God. It's obvious that whether they were actually committed followers of Jesus or not, they recognized the wisdom of this book that we call the Bible. Boy, am I ever glad that they did. How about you? But now, unfortunately, things have changed. Our leaders and most of the citizens no longer recognize the authority of the Bible. And consequently, that's the reason they are questioning the validity of the documents that were founded on that were based upon the Bible, like the Constitution. You see, there was a time in this great land of ours when if there was a debate going on between two people, if one of them could show that their argument was based solidly upon Scripture, then everybody accepted it. Well, if it's in the Bible, it must be true. That was a general thing. If it's in the Bible, it's unquestioned. It must be true. But boy, have things changed today. Today, if you take the position that a certain thing must be true because it's written in the Word of God, you're laughed to scorn. They look at you and say, why, that's just a book of antiquity, ancient philosophy. It doesn't define truth. What's true for you may not be true for me, and what's true for me may not be true for somebody else. Everything is just relative. There's no, there's no solid, unchangeable, infallible position that can be established because it's in the Bible. So everything is relative. So I, I'm telling you this morning, my dear friends, that the authority of God's Word, the Bible, has been cast aside in America in favor of man's ability to reason. And I'm going to tell you that that is absolutely a sure formula for faith. When you think that you know more than what God knows, you are headed for failure. Whether I'm talking to an individual or a church or a whole nation, when you think you know more than God and your ways supersede God's ways and your wisdom is higher than God's wisdom, you're headed for failure. Amen. And I believe that's what's happening here in America. As a nation... I feel like that we have drifted from that which our founding forefathers knew would be a good foundation. We have loosed ourselves from that solid anchor and cast our ship adrift in the ever-changing winds of reason. I think that Satan must be pretty happy about that, Brother David. Because you see, from the very first time that he started to tempt Eve back there in the Garden of Eden into sinning against God, his method first was to diminish the authority of God's Word and to cast doubt upon the validity of God's Word. He first tempted Eve, if you will remember, by saying this. He said to Eve, Yea, hath God said, now, Eve, are you really sure you understood what God said? I mean, come on. There are many different ways that you can interpret God's Word. What makes you think your interpretation is better than anyone else's? You see, you can't take what God said literally and at face value. It all has a deeper spiritual meaning. Don't take the plain sense, listen to it, and simply obey. You can't do that, Eve. You've got to look for a deeper meaning. Spiritually speaking, what he really meant was, and all filed into the wild blue yonder we go with some stupid nonsense that's not in the Bible. And I see it all over America. 
It makes me sick to my stomach. I just want to grab some people sometime by their necktie and jerk them to the Bible and say, look at what it says. Look at what it says. Take it for what it says. And people think I'm too conservative, I guess. But you see, like leaven in the loaf, sin once introduced into society, unless it is eradicated by the cleansing power of the blood of God, it will continue to grow until it has consumed the whole nation. Like ravings, you see, it grows until eventually it distorts clear thinking and it culminates in delirium. Our nation's problems are not, contrary to what some would say, is not because of the president. He's created some problems. I agree to that. But he's not the real problem. The real problem, as it is today, and as it has always been, is sin Amen. in the heart of people. Amen. That's the problem. It's a spiritual problem. What people say and what they do is a, a direct product of what's in their heart. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. When we began this departure from God's Word, the Bible, I think that it seemed uneventful. It certainly didn't seem fatal. The seemingly innocent or minor actions in the beginning seemed somewhat insignificant at least. And no one felt threatened. But we surely did not think that it would lead us to the stupidity that we see all over our country today. It wouldn't get to that. Would it? Let me tell you something. Nowhere is the delirium of our national spiritual rabies better demonstrated than by the nine people who sat in the U.S. Supreme Court whom we've allowed to dictate to the whole nation what is right and what is legal. The United States Supreme Court has time and time again chosen to ignore God's word and has heaped upon us decision after decision that has contradicted the righteousness that God desires for his people to follow. I believe that in the early 1960s, about the same time that I saw Old Yeller, our great nation contracted a kind of spiritual rabies, a potentially fatal disease if left untreated. It was at that time that the United States Supreme Court decision of Engel versus Vital decided, and I quote, that government-directed prayer in the public schools was an unconstitutional violation of the Establishment Clause, end quote. This decision was followed by a subsequent decision to ban Bible reading as part of the school curriculum in Abington Township School District versus Shemp in 1963 and to ban student-led, student-initiated prayer at football games, graduations, and other school activities in Santa Fe Independent School District versus Doe in the year 2000. And I'm telling you that this chosen path of the United States Supreme Court of taking God and His Word out of our schools and other public institutions initiated that spiritual rabies infection some five decades ago that now has traveled to the central nervous system, the houses of government. Like the physical disease, once it reaches the brain, there is no treatment. Well, that, that spiritual degradation, that rebellious attitude toward the God who created us and made us the most powerful, the most prosperous, the most blessed nation in, entire, in the entire world has now gone too far. You see, listen to what I'm going to say. The spiritual rabies infection in America has reached the brain. And in that state of mind, it's impossible, it's impossible to get good decisions from God. And you say, well, 
Wait a minute, Brother Al. Do you think it's possible that our nation could still repent and turn back to God and God would forgive us? Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I believe that. Just as it was in the days of Jonah when, you remember, he preached repentance to the wicked city of Nineveh. We could, like them, repent and sackcloth and ashes and come back to God and our God who has an infinite amount of mercy and grace in Him, He would forgive us and welcome us back and establish us again. But do I think that's going to happen? No. When we took God and His Word out of our schools back in the 1960s, you see, we spawned a whole generation that had no respect for Scripture because, unfortunately, the schoolhouse for some kids was the only place they ever heard the Bible. And it's been said that what one generation does in moderation, the next generation does in excess. And so after that one, the next generation got even worse. For then came that wanton disrespect for human life, the most sacred of all of God's creation. And then personal convenience was raised up over the value of human life and murder was legalized upon the most helpless of all segments of society, the unborn child. If it's inconvenient, just kill it. Listen, my dear friend, we dare not point our hypocritical finger at the Nazis of World War II who killed some 11 million people, 6 million of whom were Jews, in their extermination camps. We dare not attempt to take the speck out of Germany's eye when we have a beam in our own eye. Because compared to the 11 million people that the Nazis killed, we have now killed almost 60 million unborn Jews. 